He hit a full woohoo. <laughs> What's your name, bro? Who said woohoo? It was you. What's your name? Jesus. Jesus. I appreciate that enthusiasm, bro. <laughs> I appreciate that. Um, like you said, I'm Trip. I'm excited to get to be here and serve you. Uh, have y'all been having a good time so far? Yeah. Good. Good. Well, I'm going to uh, open God's word, but before we do that, I just want to pray one more time, uh, ask God for his help. Father, we come before you again in the name of your son, Jesus. We come in the name of Jesus, Father, because that's how we can approach you. It's through your son. And Father, we pray that as we spend this time in your word that you would speak to us, God. God, we pray this wouldn't be uh, just time where we just hear some opinions from a person, Father. We need to hear authoritative truth from you. Father, I pray for my friends in this room who, um, yeah, whose hearts and minds are all over the place, Father, that you would help our hearts and minds to find rest and peace in you, Father. Father, if we're close-handed, Father, if we are defensive, I pray you would help us to open our hands to hear from you. Say, so whatever you call us to, Lord, that's, that's what we want to do. Help us to see you clearly. We ask in Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Um, again, I'm, I'm excited to be here. Um, I've, I met Jesus when I was uh, a teenager. Um, and before that, uh, for me, I was a little confused about what it meant to be a Christian because I grew up around, I just grew up in an environment where everybody said they were Christians. So I knew people who, you know, went to church. Every Sunday said they were Christians. People who never went to church and said they were Christians. And people who lived these moral lives and said they were Christians. People who lived these immoral lives and said they were Christians. I was just confused about what it meant to be a Christian. Um, and I even repeated a prayer after the children's pastor when I was real little. You know, it was one of the things where I got dragged to children's church with my family, um, you know, and we, I don't remember how often we went. It was, I didn't go enough to know all the hand motions the kids were doing while singing songs. <laughs> I'll just say that. Um, and so whatever you do in children's church after we did that, color pictures, the animals on Noah's Ark, whatever we did, you know, the children's pastor was like, hey, kids, do you want to go to heaven where you will get to live forever? probably get to see any of your relatives that passed away. You can ask Jesus what happened to the dinosaurs. Then you can ride on the back of a cheetah, probably teleport <laughs> and play one-on-one -on -one basketball with Jesus forever. <laughs> or do you want to go to hell where you'll burn forever? And I was like, oh my goodness. Uh, <laughs> the first one sounded better. So I like, right, just repeat after me, repeat this prayer after him. God, God, my bad, my bad, you know, all the sinner's prayer things. <laughs> and, you know, I, I don't think I became a Christian that day because even though I was repeating these words about putting my faith in Jesus, I didn't understand who Jesus was. I didn't understand how holy God was. I didn't understand why I needed to trust in Jesus to be forgiven of sins. None of that clicked. Fast forward, God in his providence, you know, I got dragged to church again when I was a little older. And, you know, it was a sign-up for a youth summer retreat. And I, I saw the line. I was like, I am not going to sign up for that. And I looked over there with some cute girls in line. I'm like, I'm going to go sign up for that. <laughs> and I did. And though I had bad intentions, God had better ones. Uh, because as I started to go to this uh, youth group, I had a good youth pastor. I mean, we didn't only do fun stuff. He also opened up the Bible and preached the gospel of Jesus. And I heard about this Jesus. And all the stuff that hadn't clicked to me before about how holy God was, the ways I had separated myself from him, what it meant for Jesus to sacrifice himself for me, and the fact that I just wasn't a good Lord of my life. You know, not only did I not keep his laws, I didn't even keep my own. You ever been like, I, I'm done with them. I'm never going to talk to them again. And then your phone vibrates. It's like, after this, right? <laughs> I was like, I'm not, I'm obviously not great at being the Lord of my life, turn from my sin, put my faith in Jesus. Everything's been different for me since then. Not, that's, I don't say that to me like I've been perfect now, but it does mean that now I, I'm trying to think of my life in terms of being his. It belongs to him, 
Right, so then everything I liked, like I had already been rapping at that point. I wasn't good. I wasn't good. I was terrible. Um, my rap name, I think, was The Playboy at that time. Um, spelled T-H-A space P-L-A-Y-B-O-I because it's, it's more gangster to misspell stuff. It just feels <laughs> better. But at that point, you know, after I put my faith in Jesus, I'm like, what, what does all this mean for him? How can I give everything to him? Um, and so I started thinking about, you know, already I understood, like, I had braces and a mini fro. I was like, I can't rap about killing people. Not a lot of gangsters have this look. Uh, and I thought, how can I just give all of my life to Jesus? That's what I wanted to do with my music. That's what I wanted to do with any gifts I have. Um, and, you know... I only know about Jesus because people told me about him, and I only say all of this to say I'm excited to be in front of you because I want to tell you more about this Jesus that others have told me about and that I've known and that I've seen in his word. So I, I want to talk about what Jesus has to say to us today. Um, Matthew 6, um, I, I want to read the text first from Matthew chapter 6. And what, I wanna be, and what I'm going to be talking to you about is what I call reality show righteousness. Reality show righteousness. Matthew chapter 6. I'm going to start reading at verse 1. Jesus says this, Be careful not to practice your righteousness in front of others to be seen by them. If you do, you will have no reward from your Father in heaven. So when you give to the needy, do not announce it with trumpets, as hypocrites do in the synagogues and on the streets, to be honored by others. Truly, I tell you, they have received their reward in full. But... When you give to the needy, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing, so that your giving may be in secret. Then your Father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. And when you pray, don't be like the hypocrites, for they love to pray standing in the synagogues and on the street corners to be seen by others. Truly, I tell you, they have received their reward in full. But when you pray, go into your room, close the door, and pray to your Father who is unseen. Then your Father who sees what is done in secret, will reward you. And when you pray, don't keep babbling like pagans, for they think they'll be heard because of their many words. Do not be like them, for your Father knows what you need before you ask him. That's God's word. I want to talk to you about reality show righteousness, and I'll tell you why I'm calling it that. Um, in the early 2000s, there was a new uh, development in television um, where, you know, TV producers who are making TV shows, you know, it costs a lot to make a TV show. Uh, so they're like, man, how can we get new shows without having to make new scripts? And these reality shows begin to pop up. Now, of course, there are millions of reality shows now. Some of y'all watch them and you don't want nobody to know. But if I was to look at your DVR, <laughs> might be some love and hip hop on there. <laughs> God knows. Uh, but, you know, they would put some people in a, in a room, in a situation, and they would hope for drama, right? Because that's what these things usually are. And I don't know if you've ever seen a reality show, but there is plenty of drama. And there are millions of them now. Um, and reality shows, I think one of the reasons that, that people love them is it plays into a lot of things that are already part of our human nature. Things that were true before reality shows even existed, one, that we do love drama. We like to see other people fight for whatever reason. But also, we love to be seen. Uh, we love to have the, other, the, the eyes of other people on us. And, you know, I, I think a lot of us, we like social media, you know, we would like to say, oh, it's just, I just feel like I can connect with all of humanity. I can just connect with people. When in reality, a lot of us just like to have eyes on us. We like people. We all get the star in our own poorly produced reality show. And I say poorly produced because I've been seeing people in Instagram stories. It's like, bro, you could, there's a lot of filler you could have cut in that story, bro. <laughs> and here's part of the danger is that desire to be seen by other people, to have the eyes of other people on us, that can make it into our spiritual lives too. I, I, don't, I don't know if we think that we can be obsessed with the eyes of other people being on us, you know, on our way to work or a class in the morning and why we eating and why we're at a concert and why, but somehow when our spiritual life happens, we'll be able to turn that off. And here's what happens. When we are obsessed with the eyes of other people on us, when someone's watching you, doesn't that change how you act when you know somebody's watching? 
Like, just let you be just like, I don't know, just washing dishes. You know, washing dishes is, you know, uh, a product of the fall. It's not a good thing. We shouldn't have to do that, but we do. But then let somebody pull their phone out. You change your whole, you start trying to wash dishes cool, turn it into a dance for no reason at all, because now somebody's watching you, right? It changes what, what you're thinking. And so um, we love people watching us, but when we begin to do something for other people watching us, it can poison what we're doing. When we're the, aware of the, the, the eyes of other people, it starts to, uh, what other people think starts to compete with the task that you're doing. And it's very difficult to be worried about the eyes of other people and worried about the actual goal at hand at the same time. So in this text, Jesus is talking to, to his disciples. This is uh, part of Sermon on the Mount, Jesus' most famous sermon. He's talking to, to, to his followers about what it means to actually be a follower of Jesus, to be a disciple, to be a learner, a student of Jesus. And he talks to them a lot about righteousness and what true righteousness is and what good deeds are. Um, and he's challenging a lot of errors in their thinking. Um, and he tells them not only what they should do, but why and how they should do it. And here's why that matters. Because Jesus wants more from us than just doing the right stuff. Jesus also wants us to do it from the right heart. He's not just interested in us going down a checklist. And when something doesn't come from the right heart, he's going to tell us it also doesn't produce the right result. That stuff matters. And when we do good things for bad reasons, we rob ourselves of good rewards. I want you to remember that. When we do good things for bad reasons, we rob ourselves of good rewards. And that's at the heart of what Jesus is talking about. Here's what I think the main point of this, this little section is. is this. Um, if applause is what you really want, that's all you'll really get. If applause is what you really want, then that's all you'll ever get. That's all reality show righteousness can really produce is praise from other people. But Jesus is going to give us a better way, and we'll talk through it and see what that looks like. So I'm going to read verse 1 again. This is what Jesus says. Be careful not to practice your righteousness in front of others to be seen by them. If you do, you'll have no reward from your Father in heaven. Jesus knows what we will be tempted towards. And so that's why he tells us, beware, be careful, watch out. Beware of doing stuff to be seen by others. He's saying, be careful of acting like something didn't happen unless it happened on Instagram. Right? Um, because sometimes we act like other people seeing us is the only time something actually happened, like it wasn't real. Right? Like, I never wore that outfit. I seen you in it the other day, but I didn't take no pictures in it, so it don't count. <laughs> um, and so in verse 2, he's going to warn us. You know, he warns us against doing good to be honored by others. Verse 5, to be seen by others. Those five words, to be seen by them, he says, beware of doing your good deeds, to be seen by them. Those five words could sum up a lot of what we do with our lives. It could sum up a lot of the worst decisions we ever made. How many of your bad decisions could be summed up by those words? Why did you even go there to be seen by others? Why do you even hang out with them? They fake to be seen by others, right? Why are you on TikTok doing dances even though you have no discernible dance skills? to be seen by others. Being seen by others is not bad in itself, but being seen by others is always bad as a main motivation for what you're doing, especially our obedience to Jesus. Why is that? Why is it a bad main, uh, main motivation? One, because you're robbing God of his glory. So if, if worship is ascribing to God the honor and the praise that he deserves for who he is, uh, what happens when we do things based on us being seen by other people is we decide instead of giving honor with our actions, we want to do everything to receive honor. And that's a conflict of interest, especially when we remember that the God we're talking about is the God of the universe who holds the universe together by the word of his power. We're robbing God of his glory when we make it all about us. Um, scripture calls us to do everything we do for the glory of God, whether we're eating, drinking, all of that is so he can be seen. Even that word honor that he uses, that's that word dox that is also used in scripture to talk about worship and praise of God. And we're saying, we don't want you to have that God. We want 
to have that ourselves, which is robbery. This would almost be like if you were outside with a friend and there was a kid who ran out in the middle of the road and, and you was on your phone and your friend ran out and dove in front of the car and did one of them little rolls like he was in an action movie and saved this kid's life. And then some news cameras showed up. And they came up and they was like, oh my goodness, what happened here? You was like, I seen it all happen, let me tell you. This kid was in danger and I could see some vulnerability in his face as the car was driving up. And so I dove out. You know, I broke my leg a little bit, I'm limping, but I'm glad I was here. Your friend would say, bro, you, you, you was on your phone. You, you didn't even notice what happened. Why are you trying to steal my credit, All right? Um, this is what we do to God, where we decide, God, even though you're the one who does the heavy lifting, I want the credit. There, there's lots of things even in our lives that, that are going well that I want to remind you that God deserves the glory for that. You didn't do that by yourself. The, the job that you have right now, the Lord has provided for you, I want to remind you, God deserves the glory for that. You didn't do that all by yourself. If your relationships are going well in your life right now, I want to remind you, God deserves the glory for that. You didn't do that all by yourself. If you're healthy, if you made it through the pandemic in your right mind, I want to remind you, you don't deserve the glory for all that. God deserves that glory. And, and sometimes when things aren't going well, it's very clear to us that we're too weak to do everything on our own. But when God does give grace for things to go well, we forget he even exists. God deserves the glory for that. So, so one of the reasons is it's not good to do everything to be seen by others is because we're robbing God of his glory. The main reason Jesus gives us in his verse, though, is because it'll rob us of the true reward for, for the good works that God has called us to. Let's read verse 2 again. And, and we're gonna, he, he talks about two different kinds of good deeds in this little section. First thing he's talking about is giving. He says, uh, verse 2, when you give to the needy, don't announce it with trumpets as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and on the streets to be honored by others. Truly, I tell you, they've received their reward in full. I want you to, to, to just imagine this vivid picture that Jesus paints. This is, imagine a very religious man, church-going man, walking down the street, a very busy street, and he notices a guy sitting on the corner. And he thinks this guy might be in need because his clothes are tattered. It's, a, uh, tattered. it's a very hot day. And, you know, he looks around and sees that nobody's going to help him. And so this, this church-going man, he's like, man, I, I see this guy. Maybe he needs some help. He feels in his pocket to make sure he has some money to help him out. And he breathes a sigh of relief because he does. And then he looks around to see if anybody's watching, but that's okay. Nobody's really watching, but that's okay. He knows just what to do. He pulls a trumpet out of his pocket, and then he whistles, and some friends come around the corner with trumpets as well, and then they play their trumpets very loud as they walk up to the man. Now, of course, it's a busy street in the middle of the day. People are like, why are dudes wearing jeans big enough to pull trumpets out of their pockets? Don't, don't think too hard about this story. Just know they pull them out, and so now everybody's paying attention. So now when he's sure everybody is watching, he leads down toward the man and said, Excuse me, brother, I'd like to help you out. You seem to be in need. Are you in need? The man says, yes. And then he says, everybody, I want you to see this. He pulls 50 cents out of his pocket and he hands it to the man. He says, God bless you. And then he walks off. Isn't that stupid? What's stupid about it is he acts like the good deed finds its value because other people see it. This is the picture of Jesus painting, who, who, when they give, they play trumpets to make sure all the eyes and the attention are on them in those moments. The, the, the problem with the hypocrite he's talking about here is that we can often begin to care more about looking godly than actually being godly. What's most important to us is that we look like righteous people, not that we actually are righteous people which is a hilarious picture of the hypocrite. I just want you to know that God is not impressed with your little displays of fake righteousness. Maybe you can impress other people, but God is not impressed by that. And when we go after those little displays of fake righteousness, it robs us of that reward. This is what Jesus says the result is. I tell you, they have received their reward in full. In other words, whatever honor they got for that so-called good deed, I hope they enjoyed it because that's all they're going to get for. I think sometimes we think, oh, no, if people see me do good things, I can add that to the reward I receive from God for my good deeds. But what Jesus says is, no, you're actually making a trade. You're actually saying, no thanks to the rewards I could get from God. I would rather have earthly praise instead. Now, you may say, Trip, I know we're not wearing skinny jeans no more, but my jeans ain't big enough to put a trumpet in there. 
Sorry if you have on skinny jeans. It's all right. Make your own decisions. <laughs> but we still like to do things where we draw attention to us. I know you've seen people like helping people like, hey, I'm here with, what's your name? I'm here with Harold. You know what I'm saying? It's like, bro, if he needs help, just help him. We love to draw attention to ourselves. Just over here sweeping for Jesus. Y'all see me sweeping? We love to serve in ways where we can draw attention to ourselves. Um, y'all remember Drake's God's Plan video where he was like going around giving people money? I hate that kind of stuff. No offense to Drake. What God is calling us to um, is not drawing attention to our, you know, even sometimes we'll be like, man, like, let me tell you, I ran into this dude, man, he was neat. Let me tell you what he said. He said, he said, he said, I need something. And I was like, bro, I got you, right? Like, we love to retell stories. What God is saying is that when we are so obsessed with that, it takes away. And he gives us a better way. This is what he says, verse three. But when you give to the needy, don't let your left hand know what your right hand is doing so that your giving may be in secret. Then your father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. Again, he exaggerates a little bit, but he's saying, I, I want you to give in such a way, in such a secret manner, that one of your hands wouldn't even know that the other one was handing something to somebody. Right, because he's saying that other people seeing you is not the main thing. And of course, we, we can push this too far, but, but I want you to know, if, if there was a, a, a friend of yours in need and you needed to, to buy them groceries and you did it and not a single soul knew about it, would you be content with that? If you volunteered half of your time to serve other people in need and nobody else knew about it, would you be content with that? The things that you do in your life right now, ways that you serve, or ways you're, you're considering serving, and like some stuff you heard uh, this weekend, would you be cool if nobody knew about it? Uh, Jesus is saying we should, we should serve in secret. Now, this is not to say no one can ever see you serve anywhere, right? Verse uh, earlier in, in, in chapter 5 in the same sermon, Jesus says, Let our light shine before men so they may see your good deeds and glorify our Father in heaven. Right? He's saying we want people to see our light, but he's, he, th- these people are trying to be seen in order that they can honor themselves. Jesus is saying allow yourself to be seen in order to bring glory to God. So there's a big difference in being faithful to Jesus in public or trying to draw a crowd so people can see you do something good. He's calling us to be faithful to Jesus wherever we are, uh, whatever time. Y'all still with me? Okay. Um, So this is what he says. Your father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. Um, God sees what is done in secret, and that should be enough. That's the main thing he's getting at, like, no, no, you won't get that praise, but God sees. You know, sometimes we feel like I've been laboring, nobody appreciates me, nobody sees. What Scripture reminds us about is that God sees. The things that you do in your life, you're like, no one understands how hard this is for me. No one understands how difficult. I want you to know God sees. Um, you know, Scripture talks about not being weary and well-doing, or that your labor is not in vain. God sees. Now, on the other side, there can be something scary about the fact that God sees. But he says what, um, what God sees, what is done in secret, it, you know, what does your life look like in secret would be one of my questions. Usually when we hear secret, we think of scandalous things. Wouldn't it be amazing if what happens in your life in secret is not scandalous, but it's praiseworthy? There are things about our secret lives that show us more about who we are than our public lives. No one sees us. The only motivation we have to do it is the thing itself. Wouldn't it be amazing if what you do in secret brought praise to God instead of shame on him? This this is what he's calling us to. So he's going to talk about prayer now. Verse 5, this is what Jesus says as he continues. He says, and when you pray, don't be like the hypocrites, for they love standing in the synagogues and on the street corners to be seen by others. Truly, I tell you, they've received their reward in full. But when you pray, go into your room, close the door, and pray to your father who's unseen. Then your father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. Again, he brings up these hypocrites. What are they doing this time? They praying all out and in the way, making sure people can see them pray. He mentions again being in the synagogues and in the streets. What do synagogues and streets have in common? Synagogue is a public place of worship. Streets is a public place where everyone is. It's, again, a public place. And here's something that might surprise you. Hypocrites love to pray. Don't be like the hypocrites, for they love to pray standing in the synagogues. 
Here's a reminder, you can love prayer and still not love God. Some of us pray because we love ourselves so much and we want other people to love us as much as we do. Like, look how holy this prayer is. Um, it says something about the human heart that we can be so self-centered that we can even make service about ourselves. We can even make praying to God, which is supposed to be an acknowledgement that we need him, that we're weak, we need him. We can turn that into something about ourselves as well. Um, And you can probably think of somebody in your mind who's like this, who, you know, does this all the time, who prays in these big words. You know, such a churchy person who's real showy in everything that they pray and that they do. Well, I want you to, um, if you're thinking about that person, that person's in your mind, I want you to forget about them because Jesus is talking to you. All of us can be tempted toward this kind of hypocrisy. You know, usually when we think hypocrite, we think somebody who says something and then they live a completely different life. That is a very real kind of hypocrite. Another kind of hypocrite is somebody who does do the right things but for all the wrong reasons. That's what Jesus is getting at here. There's still a rot within their souls. You know, some of us, when we pray, maybe we wouldn't say God wants to hear us say a bunch of words, but then we just talk way different when we pray. Some of us be like, man, LeBron old, he not even good. Oh, we about to pray. Heavenly Father, we beseech thee. (laughs) Father, we are bewildered by your omnipotence. Bro, spell bewildered. You don't know what that means. (laughs) Who told you you have to pray like that? Sometimes we are trying to impress other people with words we looked up on the way to the prayer meeting. That's not what God has called us to, right? So some of us talk a good talk and we show up to things and we serve, but there's still hypocrisy in our hearts because we're doing it to be seen. Jesus has shown us the difference between a hypocrite and a disciple. Uh, Hypocrites just want to be seen. Disciples just want to be you. Hypocrites want status. Disciples just want to serve. Hypocrites want to put on a show. Disciples want the Lord's work to get done. Uh, Hypocrites get satisfaction from the praise of other people. Disciples find their satisfaction in pleasing Jesus. We, We want to ask ourselves, do I have the posture of a hypocrite or a disciple? And it's very hard because so much of our lives have become about being seen by other people. And all of us can be tempted toward hypocrisy. So this is not to say someone with genuine faith in Jesus can't act in a hypocritical uh, manner sometimes. Um, So so how do we fight against having, letting this hypocrisy sneak up on us? Um, One way is to be transparent about who you really are. Tell on yourself often, confess your sins. Um, It's very hard um, to, to, to both be overly concerned about fake righteousness while also being honest about who you really are. Be transparent about the ways you don't have it all together. If, if you catch a hint of people acting like you're the perfect Christian and follower of God and you make no mistakes, you should correct them right then on the spot. Because here's what happens. Once people have that view of you and you've presented yourself as this person who has it all together, then you spend the rest of your time trying to maintain that. And anything that offers any evidence to the contrary of you being this perfect Christian that you've shown people that you want to be seen as, then you begin to want to hide that stuff. I want to encourage you, do not do that. Live honestly and openly. Here's one thing I've seen. Every time I confess my sin to another Christian, even if I got to talk myself into it, like, man, I don't want him to know that I'm such a bum like this, but I'm going to confess my sin. You can do it. And I confess my sin, and people be like, bro, I've been struggling with the same thing. Every time I confess my sin to another Christian, they confess their sin back to me. Here's what happens. All of us think we're the only ones who got sin. But when we're open and transparent, what it does is it helps us to walk together, right, to help each other to grow. And I think this transparency can keep us from this self-righteous hypocrisy. Does that make sense? Um... If applause is all we're chasing, that's all we'll ever get. This is what Jesus tells us in verse 6. There's a better way than chasing applause. Verse 6. When you pray, go into your room, close the door, pray to your Father who's unseen, then your Father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. It's just like the hiding it from your hands. He's saying when you pray, go into your closet and pray. Some of us pray, but we never pray when we're alone. We only pray with other people. Do not treat 
a church, a small group, anything else, as a place to, as a platform to perform for others with prayers. I want to encourage you to make a habit of praying in private. It can be hard to pray. I don't think I've ever met a Christian who, if I said, hey, um, do you think you pray enough? They'd be like, yes. That's not typically how we feel. Most of us feel like we do not pray enough. I want to encourage you. It can be hard to, like, carve out time to pray a lot. I want to encourage you to just, like, pray in small chunks. One of the reasons is, like, this, we think we got to say a lot of words. we like, I wanted to pray this morning, but I didn't have an hour to carve out. It's like, no, nobody's praying for an hour. If they said they did, they lied. <laughs> and they need to pray about that. <laughs> nah, I mean, some people somewhere, but... Most of us do do not have the attention span to pray for an hour. And like sometimes we think if we pray briefly, like it's not a real prayer. I want to encourage you, just always be praying. Like on the way to work, just pray. On the way to school, just pray. When you get home, just, just say, Lord, please give me grace today. I know I'm going to run into this person and I'll be wanting to punch them. God, give me grace to not punch in Jesus' name. Amen. Right? <laughs> just, just be praying often. Ask God for grace. Ask God for help. When you see somebody struggling, instead of texting somebody and talking about them, ask God to help them. Always be praying. Pray when nobody knows you're praying. Pray when you, don't, you can't say you had this amazing quiet time and sound like a deep Christian. Just be in communication with your heavenly Father. Pray all the time. Scripture talks about praying without... Cease, and I want you to make it a habit. What Jesus is getting at is when you only want to pray for people to think you're deep, I hope you like that reward of people thinking you're a deep, very spiritual person because that's all the reward you'll get. I mean, it's kind of like um, The Bachelorette, which is a reality show, of course, that I'm sure none of you have ever seen, uh, (laughs) where like 30 dudes show up trying to marry the same woman, and, you know, they all say they're there for a wife. And, you know, no shade, but... I can think of better ways to meet one. (laughs) And a lot of dudes, you know, one person maybe marries the girl, but 29 of them dudes leave home with the same amount of wife that they had when they got there, which is none. (laughs) Now, maybe they got more followers. And look, if that's what you wanted, then good. I hope you're happy with the reward that you got. This is what Jesus is getting at. Um, when, When we pursue things in ways that are more about the eyes on us than actually the best way to do it, then we should... You know, just know you need to be content with the reward that you're going to get. It robs us of what we can really get. And he talks about rewards. What are those rewards that we would get from God? Well, Scripture says that um, though our only motivation to obey God shouldn't be what he'll give us in return, that he does promise to give us rewards, not because he owes them to us, just because he's gracious. God has invited us into the work that he don't even need us to do, and then he rewards us for the work that he strengthened us to do in the first place. This is the kind of gracious God that we find in Scripture. What exactly are those rewards, though? Scripture is not super clear other than we know there are good rewards that we get. And so you may say, how could I be motivated by God's rewards instead of the praise of people if I don't even know what they are? I'll give you an example. I have kids. I have a son. His name is Q. And when I first started taking him to the barbershop, you know, kids can't sit still for very long. And so I was like, hey, if you're good, if you sit still, I will give you a special treat. His eyes lit up. He was excited. And he was very still. I could have convinced him to do anything for me in that moment. When he heard those words, special treat, I should have had him do my taxes. (laughs) But I wasn't thinking ahead, so I just said, sit still, and I'll give you a special treat. You know what he didn't do? He didn't say, but hold on, hold on, hold on, Dad. What kind of special treat are we talking about? We're talking about Starburst, Skittles, goldfish, and if you got goldfish, they got to be flavor blasted. No one likes the regular ones. <laughs> Those taste like nothing. <laughs> no, he didn't do that. He said, I know my dad. My dad always comes through with the good special treats. He knew my track record. What I'm saying to you is, has the God of heaven not shown his track record? Has he not shown that he's a promise-keeping God? Has he not shown that he has good rewards for us? The God who split the Red Sea, the God who uh, put on human flesh, the God who raised Jesus from the dead. 
Has he not shown enough for us to trust him and say, I don't know exactly what those rewards will be, but I know that you are a good God who keeps his promises and gives rewards better than I could even imagine. I need you to understand like some social media likes or like somebody thinking you deep or cool or something. That sounds so dumb compared to the rewards that come from the God who owns a cattle on a thousand hills. From the God who says, uh, the earth is mine and everything that's in it. Everything that's in it. He, you know, even if we don't know exactly what those rewards look like, we do know what that God is like, and that's the kind of God that I would like to receive rewards from, who's worthy of being faithful to, and we should trust him to give us good things. Verse, verse 7, we're wrapping up. He says, when you pray, don't keep babbling like the pagans. They think they'll be heard because of their many words. At the time, you know, uh, these pagan deities, they're like, no, we have to say a lot of words to grab their attention. If we don't keep saying words, we won't be able to get the attention of these false gods. He's saying, don't be like them because we have a God who we don't get his attention by babbling a lot of words. The attention of God comes because he loves us and he wants to hear from us. You don't have to pray and sound deep and say a bunch of words. That's not why God pays attention to us. He actually says, your father knows what you need before you ask him. So when we pray to God, this is not an exercise in informing God and educating God on what's happening in our lives. God already knows. And you might say, but why would I pray? Why would I bring it to God if God already knows? We're not educating God, but casting our cares on God. We're saying, God, I give this to you. And for whatever reason, even though God already knows what's going on in your life, he wants you to bring it to him, and he finds pleasure in blessing you um, in response to you asking him to do that. Because it shows him to be the gracious, loving, good father that he is. It should not hinder our prayers that he already knows. It's to draw us to him. We're not talking about a God who will explain it, and he's like, I don't really understand exactly what that is. Can you give me a better picture? God is not like a, a judge in a courtroom where lawyers have to lay out the case or God would have no idea what actually happened. You have to show him evidence because otherwise he wouldn't know what's going on. We're talking about the God who sees everything all the time and knows about your needs before you even do. And that same God is like, hand them over to me. I got you. But he's saying it doesn't have to be public. If applause is all you really want, that's all you'll ever get. One of the reasons this, this can be hard for us is because um, we really do struggle with approval from other people. And some of us struggle with approval from other people for, for different reasons, stuff, um, just our own insecurities, stuff that happened in childhood. Some of us... Um, had relationships, formative relationships when we were young that weren't where they should be. So the approval that we missed from our dad or from our mom or our siblings or friends, whatever it is, we're always running around trying to find it in other places. And there can be an insecurity that comes from that that we have to work through and get over. Well, um, what Jesus is showing us here is there can also be a spiritual insecurity where we think there's something we have to prove about our righteousness in order for righteousness to be seen in us. But I, I, I want to tell you that there is an approval, an, an approval that comes from God that is given to us in Jesus, that we do not have to earn, that other people don't have to give us. You do not need other people to see you and point out and thumbs up your righteousness if the God of the universe has declared you righteous in Jesus. The only righteousness that really matters for your standing spiritually, is the righteousness that is given you freely from Jesus. And you can rest in that. You say, may say, Trip, how can I rest in being seen as righteous when we are all sinners? I have good news for you. There's a Savior named Jesus who lived the absolutely perfect life and then laid his life down. And he said, you're a sinner. I'll take your punishment, and you can be treated as if you lived my perfect life. Here's my perfect righteousness. You couldn't live the perfect righteous life on your own. Jesus is saying, here, I'll give you mine. It's like trying to pay with your credit card and it gets declined and Jesus shows up and he's like, I'll take your poverty here, take my car. <laughs> Act like you have my account. Your righteousness account can be full through faith in Jesus. So what I'm saying is you don't have to run around trying to find approval from other people if you already have it in Jesus. And that is free. You know, some of us are you know, wrestling with insecurities and anxieties for various reasons. Um, and there's all kind of stuff around us, um, but, but one of the things that, that's helpful for me in those moments is to remember, like, I, I spend too much time thinking about me. 
I spend too much time focusing on my own weaknesses and, the, and, and other people seeing those weaknesses. What Jesus is saying, look, e- even as you serve, I want you to remember there's a God that's much bigger than you, much bigger than this particular way you're serving. And you want that God to be so big that he looms large over every decision you make, every time you serve, every conversation you have. That's what Jesus has called us to. So maybe you're saying, look, if God sees what's done in secret, I'm in trouble, but, but, but I want you to know, even if you haven't been very generous, Jesus was, became poor so that we can be rich. I, I haven't prayed sincerely enough. Jesus did. He prayed all night till he sweat blood. Maybe you're angry. I want you to know Jesus was patient on our behalf. I could go on and on and on. There's a Savior. Um, we have perfect approval through him. So my encouragement to you is serve out of love to bring honor to God, not to yourself. Amen. Amen. Let's pray. Father, we we thank you so much for Jesus. We thank you, Father, that we don't have to manufacture a righteousness. Father, uh, we we thank you that we don't have to um, prove our righteousness to anyone. We thank you for righteousness in Jesus. Father, I pray for my friends here who... um, who are still getting to know who Jesus is, Father, who is maybe skeptical. God, I pray you would show them the beauty of a Savior who says, come as you are and I'll clean you up. Father, I pray they would see the beauty of a Savior who doesn't say, hey, just keep running on this treadmill forever. But instead, Jesus says, I'll hand you the righteousness and run in light of what I've given you. Father, we pray you would free us from people pleasing. We pray you would free us from just living every moment for other people, seeing how good we are, wanting to prove ourselves to others. Help us to live in the freedom. Help us to swim in that freedom that you've given us in your son, Jesus. We ask all of this in Jesus' name. Amen.